Let us pray. Almighty God, we bless your name for the privilege of coming before you to study your word once again today. We are asking that your spirit will breathe upon the word so that the word will become life and spirit in every heart that hears in Jesus' name. We know that ordinarily by ourselves we cannot understand your word. We may understand the letters, but we may not be able to get the best from the word. We're asking, therefore, that your spirit will take these words, interpret to our hearts, apply to our hearts, and make us recipients of blessings through the word in Jesus' name. Bless us in the study of the word today. And for all who will hear, after today, we are praying, Lord, the blessing will be reserved in the recorded message for them in Jesus' name. We pray that you strengthen every one of us as we study your word together. In Jesus' name, we pray. As you will know, if you were here with us last week, we have just started a new book, and it's the first epistle general of Peter. Last week, we looked at chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, introducing the epistle to us. Today, we're continuing and we're looking at verses 3, 4, and 5. And the topic we're looking at today, as we examine these three verses of chapter 1, is uh, the eternal inheritance of the redeemed. Please open your Bible, First Peter, chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and defiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Those are the three verses we are looking at today. But for you to be able to get a deep understanding of those verses, I need to introduce the epistle as well as those verses to you. This first epistle of Peter, it's very instructive and encouraging to believers, especially believers who are going through persecution and suffering. Why do we say that? Because the Christians to whom Peter wrote originally were actually going through persecution. Not the ordinary persecution that every believer goes through, but intense persecution, serious persecution. Let me give you the background. One and a half years before the writing of this epistle, Nero the Roman emperor, had burnt down Rome. Actually, those who have uh, studied history, they tell us that Nero was a person that loved beauty and aesthetics. He looked at Rome, and he felt that Rome needed to be rebuilt. But there was no way he could tell the citizens and inhabitants of Rome. So what he did was to send some people uh, that will set the whole city ablaze. And that happened in July AD 64. And for three days and three nights, all the buildings in Rome and the temples and the household gods and all the valuables to the people, the idols were very valuable to them. Everything was destroyed in flames. And the people became homeless and helpless and the resentment was very great, deadly and bitter. And Nero knew that he would become unpopular because of that thing. So he turned around and he blamed the burning of Rome upon the Christians. The Christians were already unpopular because they will not worship Caesar. The Christians were already unpopular because they accused them of cannibalism. Because of their Lord's Supper. And they said they were drinking blood and eating the body of uh, Jesus Christ. They interpreted that to mean that uh, they were actually slaying people and killing them. And uh, eating them. And so when this one was added, that they had now burned down Rome, and everybody lost their homes and lost everything, they became very, very bitter against the Christians. It brought hatred and intense persecution against the Christians, not only in Rome, but in the Roman Empire in general. Those Christians then needed encouragement and instruction. How were they to conduct themselves in crisis? How were they to live in the hatred they found themselves in? That's why as you look at this epistle, it will, bear, it will strike you that he was writing to people that were suffering. In fact, he mentions their kind of suffering in every chapter. Run through with me, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Wherefore, 
Ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being more precious than that of gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know, therefore, he was talking about trial, he was talking about persecution. Go to chapter 2. In chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, it says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. But what glory is it when ye be buffeted for your faults? Ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable unto God. In chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, appear ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, he reminded them that he knew what they were going through, intense persecution and suffering it was. In fact, in chapter 4, he tells us in this way, in verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, intense persecution, which is to try you, as though some strange sin happen unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when is glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy and then he tells them in verse 16 of that same chapter yet if any man suffer as a christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify god on this behalf in fact when he gets into chapter 5 he's still reminding them that he knows what they are going through and that's exactly the reason why he's writing to them in chapter 5 verse 10 but the god of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered for a while, make you perfect and slavish and strengthen and settle you. And so you see that in every chapter, he mentions their suffering. He mentions their trial. He mentions their persecution. And then he was writing to them of the hope that we need to have in the Lord, even though we are suffering persecution. And the background, therefore of this episode we're looking at is the suffering of the believers and if you are suffering understand that uh, you are in the same boat in the same ship with those people that peter wrote and as you come week after week you are going to discover there is a lot of comfort and hope and confidence you find in this chapter but then if suffering was the background what is the real theme of the episode there's no time to go through the first and the second epistles, but if we go through the first epistle alone, you will understand he was writing on the theme of the second coming of Christ. And again, from chapter 1, he begins to remind them, Christ is coming. And the time is short. Whatever you are going through is just for a brief time. And because in the, in the anticipation of the coming of the Lord, because he's going to reward you when he comes, endure it's just for a time. Look at chapter 1 verse 5. It says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Listen to this now. Ready to be revealed in the last time. It was reminding them the last time is almost about here. And the Lord is going to come. And then it says, in that same chapter 1 verse 7, that the trial of your faith being more precious, than that of gold which perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. Listen to this at the appearing of Jesus Christ, he was reminding them their suffering will not be forever. The Lord is coming. In verse 13, it says, We are forget of the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be revealed and brought unto you when at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He reminds them, therefore, that the Lord is coming. And the Lord for whom they are suffering will soon appear. And when he appears, he's going to appear with glory and honor and majesty and reward and a crown for them. Because of that, they were to endure and endure hope to the very end. In chapter 2 and in verse 12, chapter 2 verse 12, it says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, I told you, you were speaking against them as if they burnt down Rome. They may, by your good Good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. He said the Lord will soon come. There will be a mighty visitation and revelation. And at that time, you are going to rejoice. In chapter 4, verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, watch unto prayer. 
And then in verse 13 of that same chapter, it says, But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, it's talking about the second coming of the Lord, it will soon come. When his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. And then in chapter 5, verses 1 and 4, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He's saying that the Lord is coming. When he comes, he'll come in a cloud in a halo of glory. And then when the glory is revealed that they are going to be rewarded in verse 4, when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You understand then that Peter was writing to these believers who were going through persecution. And he told them that although that when you are going through persecution, you will be thinking about death. And many people were even threatening them, you are going to die, you are going to die. The persecution is not going to be a moderate thing. It is going to be unto death. And therefore Peter said, don't worry about that. He said, number one, there's a lively hope. Number two, there's a living word. And then number three, there is living stone. It says, even though they are talking about death, it will not result into death. It will result into life because we serve Christ who has life in him and who is able to make us a quick in us and make us alive that's the background of uh, what we're looking at the background of the situation and the circumstances of those uh, believers that peter wrote to and if you find yourself in persecution and suffering then you understand that this episode is for you and i'm encouraging you to come every monday every week as we're going to be studying together we have divided the study of today into three parts. Number one, regeneration and our purifying hope. Regeneration and our purifying hope. Number two, the reservation of our permanent heritage. The reservation of our permanent heritage. And number three, the redeemed, kept as preserved heirs. That is, the people that inherit the inheritance of above. Let's begin at point number one regeneration and our purifying hope come to verse 3 again it says blessed be the god and the father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead here peter as he begins the epistle introduced himself and he said i am peter and i told you last week he introduced himself with that a good name Cephas in the original that Christ had given him a stone stable and solid and steadfast and then he he was uh, telling them they have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of the Lord and they have been saved and brought into the kingdom and they are saved into obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of the lamb the blood of Jesus and now he gets into what we call doxology that means he praise he begins to praise the Lord because of what he has done what has he done he has begotten us again that's been born again that's been regenerated that's coming into new life from the dead who are dead in sins and trespasses but praise be to the name of the lord glory be to the name of the lord blessed be the god and the father of our lord jesus christ Peter, why are you singing and shouting his praise? Because according to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again. He has begotten us again. We are born again. And because we are born again, there are so many things associated with that being born again. That's why he was singing praises unto the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Paul writing to the Ephesians 2, he was praising the Lord because of what the Lord has done. Has he not brought us from darkness unto light? Has he not brought us from death unto life? Has he not brought us from the society of dying people unto the society of regenerated people? People that are living and that will live forever. And so in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heaven 
heavenly places in Christ. Here Paul was thinking about our salvation, our sanctification, our regeneration, our renewal, and then the blessings that will give us in eternity. And he says, we need to bless the name of the Lord for that. And then he tells us, you know, Peter said that we are praising God because according to his abundant mercy, he has regenerated us, begotten us again unto a lively hope. Why did he do that? Because of our merit? Because of any goodness in us? Because of some religious uh, things we have done? He says no, according to his mercy. And I dare tell you today, if you have not been born again, and you are waiting to merit salvation, you are waiting to be qualified, it is not by merit, it is by the mercy of God. You don't need to do anything. Christ has done everything. And according to his abundant mercy, all your sins can be forgiven. And a new life can come unto you. And you can join Peter and say, Blessed be God, because according to his mercy, when I was not worthy, he made me to be born again, begotten unto a lively hope. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, you will never be so poor in your sin that the riches of the mercy of God will not touch you and reach you where you are. The mercy is inexhaustible. It's so deep and it's so high and it's so broad that no matter where you are coming from, the mercy of the Lord will reach you. God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, where we say love does even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us. That's been begotten again, making us alive. Together with Christ by grace, are ye saved? And then he has raised us up together and made us to see together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In verse 8, for by grace are ye saved. I'm sure you know that if you may long in the church, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's the mercy of God. You don't need to do anything. It's paid for it all. It is done. And therefore you can come to the Lord. For by grace are you saved. Saved from sin. And saved from hell. And saved from eternal perdition. By the grace of God which is available for you. You are saved. And it is through faith. And you know if you've been here. We've been talking about faith. That is forsaking all. I trust him. You forsake all your good works. You come with nothing in your hand. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cleave. And by that grace of God, which is abundant, which is sufficient, which is available today, you can come by faith. And then it says, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. And so, as uh, Peter was praising the Lord, so Paul was praising the Lord because of this being born again. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. In First Peter chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, that's the basis of our salvation, that's the foundation of our salvation, that is the very fountain of our salvation. I've told you, and we need to repeat it again, not because of the work of your hand, not because of your religiosity, not any good thing you have done. You just come and you lean upon the grace and the mercy of the Lord. What has the mercy done for us? Has begotten us again has begotten us again. How do you understand that? That means he has made us to be born again. You were born once, that's natural birth. You are born once, but you are born into a dirty world. You need to be born again, now into the kingdom of God. And Peter was praising the Lord. He said, we were all born once, but some of us were selected. Some of us were chosen. Some of us were called, and we responded to the call of God. We went beyond the first birth, the natural birth, and now we are begotten again. We are born again. We are regenerated. We are brought into new life. Actually, Jesus first spoke about that when he was talking to Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John. John chapter 3 reading from verse 3. John chapter 3 from verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what you need. That's what everybody needs. Except a man be begotten again. By the mercy of God, because of the love of God, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In verse 5, uh, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. That's the word of God. That's the word that brings conviction. 
That's the word that brings conversion. That's the word that leads you onto your knees and you begin to confess your sins. Oh Lord, I'm a sinner. I've done what I shouldn't have done. I feel guilty. I feel dirty. But I know you're a merciful God and your word has assured me, whosoever will come on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then the Spirit of God will be a witness with your heart. It doesn't take a long time. It doesn't have to take a whole day, a whole month, a whole year. Right at that point when you confess your sins and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you'll be born again and it is a spirit that bears witness with our conscience with our heart that we're the children of God you are born of the water of the word you are born of the spirit and except that happens he cannot see the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh born once is flesh that which is born of the flesh born naturally by a woman is still flesh and the works of the flesh he will do and there is no way he can live a victorious life but and that which is born of the spirit is spirit that is when the spirit of god gets hold of you and then you get hold of the spirit of god and you confess your sins to god and say god here am i i want all my sins to be taken away and you are holding on to the promise of god you will not let go then you become born again and james talks about that in james chapter 1 james chapter 1 verse 18 of his own will begat he us of his own will he loved us he willed our salvation he willed our repentance and of his own will he begat us with the watch of truth that we should be a kind of false fruits of his creatures that means he now separates us unto himself and become a peculiar people unto the lord we are born again we are regenerated there is a new life in us now because uh, you know the new birth has taken place we are no more what we used to be because of the new birth that has taken place and uh, if you are a child of god if you are born again like peter was praising the lord you will be praising the lord to you and you will be saying that when i thank the lord i am no more what i used to be now i am born again you know the christian is a man or the woman who has been begotten by god unto a new kind of life when someone is begotten of god there comes into that person's life a change that is so radical that the only way you can describe it is that a new life is begun it's like he has never lived all his past before he was begotten again you can forget all about it it was like he was dead everything is buried but now he comes into new life that's what is called regeneration that's what is called justification by faith that's what is called forgiveness of all your sin that's what is called redemption by the hand of the lord this new birth when it happens it happens by the will of god because it is an act of god himself it is not what a man can achieve by himself just as he cannot achieve the natural physical birth by himself as we look at the new birth in the new testament there are some things that come out number one it is the work of the spirit of god it is not attained by man's effort it is a work of recreation that is done by the spirit of god and when the spirit of god does it the same way he did it for john the same way he did it for peter the same way he did it for paul the same way he will do for you because his work is perfect he cleanses you he forgives you he does it by his own power and if you will allow him to do it in your life today if it has not been done you will know that it's a refreshing thing he'll give you peace all the remembrance of your sins will vanish away and the spirit of god will be living inside your heart bearing testimony with you all the time you are now a child of god number two the result of that rebirth the result of that regeneration is a recreation that means you are brought in touch with eternity and you receive eternal life you receive something you can never receive here on earth it is coming from heaven and you are remade you are renewed you are recreated there is a change that comes upon your life you have been trying to do good by yourself trying to live a righteous life by yourself you could not do it but then the spirit comes in it changes you and transforms you you become a new creature number three such a man such a boy such a girl such a woman that is begotten is begotten unto a lively hope the sinner is without hope without christ is hopeless in this world he doesn't know where he's coming from he doesn't know where he's going 
He just looks at you. And that is all he has. But the Christian, when you are born again, there is a hope in you that Christ, our Redeemer, is coming. And when he comes, he is going to prepare a place for you and is preparing you now for that place. He will take you home to himself. When you are born again, you are begotten unto a living hope, a lively hope. Number four, the rebirth of the Christian we're talking about is a rebirth unto righteousness. You are washed, you are cleansed, you are purified, and the chains and the shackles of the bad habits of the past, everything is broken and destroyed. And now you are given the power that enables you to walk a walk of righteousness. Number five, the new bird that we're talking about here is a birth to love. We are born again out of love, and then God is love. We're in God, we're in love. You knew bitterness before. Everybody that has been a sinner will know what we call anger, will know what we call irritation will know what we call bitterness and you carried that about for many years and it was eating you up from within but when you are born again for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life and because he first loved us he plants that love in you and then his love is shed abroad in your heart the bitterness is gone the anger is gone the irritation is gone you are born again into the love of God that's the result of being born again number six it also means that you are as a Christian now you are born to be free now you are free from that unforgiving bitterness of the past of the self-centered life now you have the victory life ceases to be a continual daily defeat now you have victory over sin and victory over the pleasures of the flesh and the pleasures of the world but not only that you have hope now come back to first peter chapter one and verse three blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope unto a lively hope christ in you when you become born again you are in christ and christ is in you and the result of that is that you look up every day you know the lord will soon come you look at the sky you know that one day those skies will be broken open and your redeemer will appear and then you will go with him that's the hope of the believer and it is a new birth that gives you that hope in colossians chapter 1 verse 27 colossians 1 27 to whom god would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the gentiles which is christ in you the hope of what the hope of glory and if you have that hope in you it will do something it's a purifying hope in first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 behold verse 1 what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not beloved now are we the sons of god because we are born again begotten again unto a lively hope and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I pray that will be your portion in Jesus' name. In verse 3, and every man, that means everyone, boy, girl, man or woman, adult or young fellow, every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself even as he is pure. And Peter is very quick to tell us that we're born into this lively hope. We're begotten again into this lively hope because of one fact. It says in chapter 1 verse 3 of 1 Peter, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what has done it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is a pity for those who do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When I say they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they may believe that he was a great teacher. They may believe that he was a good man. He was a righteous man. But they do not believe that he died and was buried three days and he rose again by the power of God because it is that resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes us eventually to have that new life in us and we are born into that lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Then he tells us there is a consequence of that we move now to point number two in point number two the reservation of our permanent heritage this is wonderful and this is something unbelievers know nothing about because the hope of unbelievers is limited to this world but for those of us who are born again for those of us who are now children of god in the family of god 
there is a hope within us. We are born again into this lively hope. We know that all we have is not limited to what we have here on earth. There is something waiting for us there in heaven. Look at it in verse 4. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. There is a lot in that verse. It says hey, there's something joyful and happy here. It says, are you a child of God? Remember now the people that he wrote to. These were the people that were strangers in the world. And I told you last week in that study, we're strangers and pilgrims. We do not have any continuing city here. And we do not join in the extravagance and the possessions and the politics of the land. And the people who are working for the day, the people who are living only for the world and they are massing the things of the world and they look at their inheritance in the world they're looking at us and pitying us as if hey, what a pity you have nothing what a pity you are a christian and because you are a christian you cannot run in the rat race with us and amass and collect and possess all the things we are possessing and these people were scattered because of persecution in fact the persecution also made them to lose a lot of things they had possessed before but peter said don't worry about that because now you have begotten into a lively hope to an inheritance and that inheritance is incorruptible number two it is undefiled number three it fadeth not away number four it is reserved in heaven for you he was making a comparison with the inheritance of the people here on earth the inheritance of the people here on earth the things the people are massing here on earth number one they are corruptible things whether it is silver or gold or garments or property or whatever, they, they lose value. And that's why you find if you bought something 10 years ago and you have been using it, now you want to sell it, you are going to sell it at a very low price because it has lost value, depreciated. But he's telling you that although the inheritance they have in the world depreciates and it lessens in value, but the one you have in heaven is incorruptible. Number two, it is undefiled. And if you look at anything here in the world, it loses its beauty. It has blemish in it. But he's saying that the one we have in heaven which is reserved for us is undefiled and then it says it fades not away the lapse of time does not affect its beauty even we ourselves here in the world as you are growing old and you are growing older you are losing the beauty you are losing the charm you're losing everything that you got before that made you felt very very strong but it says that when we get to the other side we'll be in perpetual you and our inheritance will retain its eternal glory. Let's look at this inheritance that the Bible is talking about. And let's look at it as the New Testament is full of encouragement telling us, endure. Whatever you lose here on earth means nothing. Because you are going to have an inheritance when you get up yonder. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Reading there from verse 32. And now brethren, I commend you. To God and to the watch of his grace, which is able to build you up, listen to this, and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The word of God, coming here to study the word of God is not in vain. And your quiet time, family devotion, studying the word of God is not in vain. It is reassuring you. The word of God is touching your life, transforming your life, preparing you for that eternal inheritance which you are going to have. It will give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. The inheritance up there is not for sinners. The inheritance up there is not for backsliders. The inheritance up there is for people who are washed. The people who are cleansed, the people who are saved, the people who have their names in the book of life, the people who are walking in righteousness and holiness, the people who are sanctified by faith in Christ. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. When it says me, it's not faith in Paul. It's Christ talking to Paul and it was Christ using the word me. That means then Paul was preaching Christ. And when he preached Christ to the people, they responded. When they responded to the preaching of the gospel, one thing will happen, their eyes will be opened. Well, number one, their eyes will be opened to the fact that they are guilty. 
their eyes will be open to the fact that the guilt will never be taken away until they look at Calvary. Number three, their eyes will be open to the fact that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be forgiven, shall be saved. Not only that, when they receive the word of God, the word of the gospel, like you are receiving it already tonight, they will be turned from darkness unto light, the darkness of sin, the darkness of idolatry. They will be turned away from dark darkness and they come to the light, they will be turned from the power of Satan, from the power of occultism, from the power of witchcraft, from the power that is negative belonging to the devil, they will be turned unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin. That's the bottom line. If we just study the Bible to have knowledge, that's not very useful. If we just study the Bible to say we have covered Hebrews, we have covered James, we have covered Ephesians, we have covered the Psalms, that's not very useful. If we don't receive forgiveness of sins, the reason you are here, whether it is Monday or Sunday or any other day, is that when you hear the word of God, the word of God will give you the assurance that the grace of God is available. All the sins we have committed since we were born until the present day, everything can be forgiven. That ye may receive the forgiveness of sins. And when the sins are forgiven, that's regeneration, that's redemption. Our sins are taken away. And then inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Christ. There is an inheritance waiting for us. In fact, Paul the Apostle was praising the Lord in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, he was glorifying the Lord. He says, look at what we are receiving now. This is just a tip in the iceberg. That is, this is just a little of our inheritance in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory he said the salvation we have got now the redemption we have got now the the forgiveness we have got now is a down payment it's like a deposit it's telling you that there's a lot waiting for you just get this because of your faith have this salvation have this forgiveness have this redemption as a deposit as a down payment as an earnest of our inheritance which we're going to have when we will see him face to face those of us who have been born again i pray that we remain with the lord in jesus name and when that time will come, that he will give out the inheritance one by one, the inheritance that is incorruptible, the inheritance that is undefiled, and inheritance that fadeth not away, you will receive your portion in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. It's telling us that uh, what you are having is not just something temporary. When we talk about salvation, some people think, well, that religious sin, they want me to join their church. They want me to join their fellowship. It's much more than that. We're calling you to the salvation of the Lord because Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary so that he will bless your life here on earth. You will have the peace of God. You will have the righteousness of God and all your sadness and sorrow. He will take everything away. Bad luck and curse and the power of Satan he will take away from your life. Not only that, he makes you happy in the life here and then when you get to heaven there is an eternal inheritance that is waiting for you. And that eternal inheritance is nothing to be compared with the things that the people of the world are receiving. There is a wide gap. The English people will say there is a world of difference between what the unbelievers have and what you have because you are a child of God in first Corinthians chapter 9 first Corinthians chapter 9 verse 25 it says every man is talking about athletics it's talking about those young people that you know they rejoice and maybe it is football or it is uh, basketball or throwing discord or javelin or badminton whatever it is and they feel that they are going to receive something and at the end of the day maybe it's just a handshake uh, from the president that they're going to receive when they forget you know after a few days or uh, in the, those uh, days gone by they 
might receive some naira into their pocket and the thing doesn't last and then he's not comparing what those other people receive and what we are going to receive look at it and every man that has striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown they do it to receive something that will vanish you but we and incorruptible the promise of god is that we're going to receive an inheritance that is incorruptible come back to first peter first peter chapter one we're looking at verse four it's telling us that the heavenly inheritance is the ultimate end of our regeneration and it is a hope of that inheritance that gives us the present joy in our christian life it is the hope of that inheritance that makes you to say i know my husband is making trouble but i know that the trouble will soon be over i know that uh, my wife is making trouble but the trouble will soon be over i know that the family is making trouble but the trouble will soon be over i know that in my place of work they don't like me because i take my stand for righteousness but it will soon be over i know know that they deny me of days and days and that in my place of work because of my christian stand but all that will soon be over in fact when everything is over the inheritance i'm going to have will be way beyond what all these other people are having and that's what gives a believer the present joy in his christian life whatever trials whatever persecution he may be going through the many mansions in our father's house have been kept from the beginning and is still being cared for the redeemed right now they are being girded being cared by the power of god and there is no corruption no defilement no destruction that can reach them in that eternal shelter the inheritance we're told is number one incorruptible our best possessions on earth they perish uh, i want to ask you some of the clothes you wore 20 years ago and when you were wearing that cloth you were like a king you were like a queen and you felt that you could go for beauty contest in this cloth where are those clothes now corruptible defiled fits away it's no more there and i dare say that some of the things uh, household utensils you had some 15 years ago every time you wanted to serve a visitor that you really respected you'll bring uh, that thing out it was a pride of the home where are they now corruptible it fades away and it's defiled you don't even want to see them again now and that's what we're saying is the same thing everything that people have on earth is uh, passing away but it's telling us that what we are going to have when we see him face to face number one is incorruptible number two it is undefiled there is no earthly beauty and there is no earthly possession uh, which is free from blemish but the heavenly inheritance is wholly entirely eternally pure nothing defiling will ever enter there and then he tells us it fadeth not away the lapse of time the passage of time will never affect its beauty that means then if you are a christian and you will sail through and you go through and you remain with the lord wonderful is going to be your inheritance on that final day and uh, when you get that inheritance you will look at yourself and you say is it me you will call your brothers and sisters to say isn't it worth it all that we went through when we were in the world all the endurance we had when we were in the world and then you will tell yourself and others will tell you it is worth it i pray that the lord will preserve you until that time in jesus name in first peter chapter 5 we're looking at verse 4 first peter chapter 5 verse 4 and when the chief shepherd shall appear ye shall receive a crown of glory which fadeth not away it will be yours in jesus name but you know something it says in that chapter 1 verse 4 the latter part it says research in heaven for you except to endure till the end there are some things you'll never get you need to endure to the end so that that inheritance nobody will take it away from you now we come to number three the redeemed kept as preserved heirs the redeemed kept as preserved heirs we're looking at uh, chapter one of first peter verse five who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time here peter was encouraging the believers let me remind you that these believers were scattered all about some of them were even missing some real fellowship they had enjoyed when they were in their cities because now persecution had scattered them and in the places where they were 
And maybe they were feeling that the fellowship was not as strong, as sweet, as enriching as it used to be. And maybe some of the fire that is burning them and the persecution, intense persecution heaped upon them and the law enforcement agents of uh, Nero's uh, kingdom running after them and in fear and uh, timidity all the time. They were thinking, uh, will we ever be able to sail through? We're believing the Lord now. If this persecution increases a little bit more, I might give up. I may not be able to sail through. And then Peter reassured them, there is eternal inheritance waiting for you in heaven. That has been kept for you. And while you are here, the power of God will not fail. That power of God will keep you. And that same power will keep every one of us in Jesus' name. It says, who are kept by the power of God. Kept by the power of God. I want you to follow that thought. And then I want you to understand that word that is used as kept in the original Greek is actually a military metaphor. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 32, it is used to mean kept with a garrison. That means we who are the redeemed of the Lord, the heirs of the incorruptible inheritance, we are kept, we are guarded, we are garrisoned, as sit were by reinforcements of divine strength. We are kept by the power of God, we are kept in the power of God. Think of that power as surrounding you like a fortress with massive walls and even though you are weak and feeble once you remain inside that fortress the arrows of the enemy will never catch you and all the darts of you want will never catch you they may try to throw anything at the castle it might strike at the castle it will bounce back it will never get to you only remain in the love of God and remain in the word of God your security is certain in Jesus name the enemies may run around and prowl around the base of the fortress. But the walls are so high and you are set within that uh, fortress. They cannot climb onto it and their fire cannot reach, cannot touch or shake any of the stones and the walls. If you dwell in God, and I know you will dwell in God, you will be dwelling in safety. And whatever stones may rage without, there will be peace within your heart in Jesus' name. We are kept by the power of God. We are preserved for the inheritance that is waiting for us. And even though you might think that you are weak, you remain uh, dependent upon the Lord. Eventually you will find one day it will be over. I think about the time you were born again. Maybe you were born again five years ago. Do you remember the persecution you had about four years ago? And you thought, I will never get through this. I'll never get through this. I'm about to backslide. And just about the time you think you are going to give up, help came from above. And there you are today. Don't you think the person, the, the mighty power of God that kept you for these five years, for these 15 years, for these 25 years, if you have another 25 years to spend, that same power will keep you in jesus name he has never failed and he will never fail we are kept by the power of god whatever you are going through in your place of work understand it will not overcome you you will overcome i said you will overcome in john chapter 17 john chapter 17 here jesus praying for his own disciples and if you are one of the disciples of the lord jesus christ hear the lord praying for you in john chapter 17 reading from verse 11 and now i am no more in the world and these are in the world and i'm come to thee holy father keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are one the lord will keep you by his power in verse 15 it tells us i pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil it may fly on this side and fly on that side it will never touch you the Lord will preserve your life till the very end. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, here we're given assurance. If you have been born again, if you have given your life to the Lord, he that has begun that good work of salvation is able to complete it till the final time. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you. Are you saved? I said, are you born again? As the good work of the Lord begun in your heart, well understand, he that has begun a good work in you, he will perform it until when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. I will see you on that day. 
you will be there in Jesus' name. Because he keeps the feet of his people. In Jude verse 20 and verse 24. Jude verse 20 and verse 24. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. In verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's all you do. Just remain in the love of God. Remember the love of God for you. And remember that that love will never fail. It's the love that sought you out. It's the love that has kept you till this day. And it is that same love that will keep you until the final day. In verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Is he able to keep you from falling? Oh yes, the temptation may be there. The trials may be there. Suffering may be there. Persecution may be there. But unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to preserve you faultless. Oh, you say you have many falls. Don't worry about that. There is a fountain of the blood of Jesus Christ. And tonight, as you go to that fountain, it will keep you faultless in Jesus' name. And then he'll preserve you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And uh, that's why we are with uh, Peter. And uh, we are saying that what the Lord has uh, done for other people, he will do for every one of us in Jesus' name. He reassures us that if we have been born again, there is a lively hope. He tells us if we have been born again, then there is inheritance for us. If we have been born again, then the Lord is able to keep us. And uh, we are singing and praising the name of the Lord as he did in his own time. So we are doing today. And we say, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. He says it as something that has happened already. As some people say they cannot be sure of their salvation here on earth. He said he has begotten us again unto a living lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for 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 you, for you, and then who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, that's the final salvation, that's the final perfection, that's the glorification, ready to be revealed in the last time. And that's exactly what uh, Paul the Apostle saw when he wrote in uh, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, and it says in verse 31, what shall we say to these things we have been talking about, to the fact of salvation, what shall we say to the fact of the grace of God, what shall we say to the fact of the mercy of God? What shall we say to the fact of the inheritance that is left for us? What shall we say about the power of God that is able to keep us until that time? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? If you need anything to help you on your journey, to help you on your pilgrimage, as you are toiling on and walking on and joining on here, from here until you get to heaven everything that we need of his grace of his power of his love he will supply to you so that he'll be able to keep you faithful until that final time that's why he says so shall lay anything to the charge of god's elect it is god that justifies who is see that condemned that means you are born again the devil cannot even condemn you now your past sins are all forgiven they cannot condemn you anymore oh yes the devil can bring remembrance of them you are a sinner he'll be using present tense because his grammar is not correct when he should be using past tense you are a sinner, you are no more a sinner your sins are gone and there is nobody that can bring condemnation on you today, it is Christ that died yea rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ I said who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, let's read it together out loud. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Praise the Lord. 
For I am persuaded, Paul the Apostle said, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to assure you before we even get over there, I'm congratulating you because you're almost there already in Jesus' name. The power of God will keep you in Christ. He will keep you in the truth. He will keep you in holiness. He will keep you in the fold. He will keep your name in the book of life. He will keep you in grace. And those of us that are serving God, and many of you were expecting to join us and serve God, He will keep us in the service of God. He will keep us away from Satan. He will keep us away from false prophets. He will keep us from falling. And when that day appears and Christ appears in the air, we shall see Him. And we shall be rewarded. Why don't you rise up and praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be God. And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has begotten us unto a lively home. By the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says to us. That to an inheritance. Incorruptible. Undefiled. That fadeth not away. Reserved in heaven for you. And then he tells us. That you are kept by the power of God. You are kept by the power of God as you believe on the Lord and you continue to believe on the Lord unto that final salvation, unto that glorification ready to be revealed in the final time. Have confidence in the Lord. He will keep you till the final day. He will keep you till the final day. Temptations may be there. Trials may be there. Troubles may be there. Persecution may be there. He will keep you till that final day. My brother, my sister, don't give up. Your rewards are waiting for you. My young uh, students, uh, people, don't give up. Your rewards are waiting for you. When the persecution is a little bit tough, and when the road is a little bit rough, remember it will not be long. It will not be long. And nothing shall separate you from the love of Christ. Your reward is waiting for you. Your reward is waiting for you. And the power of God, the love of God, the grace of God is abundantly sufficient. He will keep you until that final day.